Hello there, welcome back to the Agostino Zinga show with I, your host, Agostino Zinga, and this is episode number 643. That is 643 of the Agostino Zinga show with I, your host, Agostino Zinga. I hope you are doing well wherever this podcast may find you. I hope you are doing splendid. I hope you are doing well. How am I? You know, all good, all things considered, all good, all things considered. I've had a bit of a boring couple of weeks, I'm not going to lie. Most of it's been spent indoors, going to the gym, you know, eating right, reading, watching movies and stuff. But it's not been social. There's not been anything on my um, calendar that's really pushed me to go outside. And I think it's probably by design, or it's probably by default, because I reckon, for the most part, weirdly enough, societally, as people, we tend to kind of ease into the new year. No one comes into it, whack, bang, ready to go. Everyone kind of eases into it, especially if you've had a really bad end to last year. You kind of want to get yourself back on the straight and narrow. And the best way to do it in January is just to chill, relax and take it easy. And that's what a lot of us tend to do. And I know I tend to do that myself, especially when you think about new resolutions and whatnot. I know a lot of people out there are probably doing dry January, so they're fighting that. But in, te- in general, I've noticed a real kind of, I'll say, malaise into January. And January also is one of those months that's a bit boring. It's a bit long unnecessarily. Um, it's kind of, go- it feels like it's going into like its fifth week when it's not really. Um, but then by the time February comes along, you know, by the time that's finished, we're already hit, heading into kind of springish and already here the summer. Here's a bloody summer. But we have to kind of get through this sort of like dry, sluggy first couple of or three months um, in, in the beginning of the year. So apart from the usual stuff that I do on a daily basis, it's been a bit quiet. It's been a bit quiet. But apart from that, I've had a very interesting, I feel like, insight. I feel like, um, how do you say it? Insight, I would feel like... Um, in terms of things that I kind of do in my life day to day, because I had a situation happen a few days ago where I realized that although I do go around with this persona or this sort of like outer shell that I generally don't care about certain things, especially when it comes to like friends and stuff and hanging out with people or whatnot, I think there is a little bit in me, a little bit in me, a really tiny, tiny, minuscule drop in me, regard, you know, especially depending on the person, that's definitely looking for validation. That's definitely looking for somebody to kind of like pat me on the back, say things are okay. And also that kind of idea of looking for someone to kind of like you, quote unquote, not in a romantic way, just in like a, you know, a friendship way. Like, hey, I like you. I think you're cool. But I think in life in general, what I've kind of, you know, slowly but surely started to accept is that for the most part, for the most part, you really cannot, you really, really, really cannot, 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 um make someone like you especially in that way it's just impossible to do and sometimes people don't like you for things that you have no idea about and more often than not more or more than more something i have to stress completely is that it's none of your business why they don't they're not obliged to tell you why they don't they don't need to detail it to you explain it to you validate to you in any kind of way for you to get the message it should just be enough for them to say nah i'm cool on you keep it moving that should be enough but for whatever reason there's a little part of me that's always kind of looking for the explanation, looking for the why. And it doesn't really matter, really, to the end of the day, because it's never going to be what I think it's going to be in my head. So there's that kind of weird, imagined nostalgia, imagined nos- um, reverence, uh, imagined compatibility, imagine whatever, whatever it may be. It's a kind of like, I'm, I'm thinking all up in my head. It doesn't really exist in the real world. Or it's kind of one-sided. That's what it kind of be. It makes kind of one sided. It kind of makes me think a little bit of like unrequented love, and that's sort of in the same way. But you know, without the sop- soppy romantic side of it, this is just on purely friendship level. But it kind of reminds me of unrequented love, like you know those times and occasions when you're a kid and it's Valentine's Day and you write on a bit of paper, "Oh, um, do you like me?" I don't necessarily think it's always like that. You like me, yes or no box. I don't necessarily think you want to kiss the person, you want to sleep with the person, you want to be with them. It's just you kind of outwardly asking somebody if they want to be your friend. And when somebody ticks that no box or something, it's a brutal, especially more so if that person ticks a no box and tries to write something touching, like, oh, thank you for letting me say, no, don't write anything touching. Just tick the no box and keep it moving. It kind of reminds me back in the day of like, I remember doing, when I used to do club promoting, you know, with a couple people I used to do it with, whatever. 
and we would um, first, you know, in the first time we would do it, you'd kind of put events up on Facebook. That'd be the way everyone used to kind of like find events. Now I think it's kind of splintered across like RA and Dice and other sort of TikTok platforms. But usually back in the day, it was always Facebook was the first port of call to find out what's going on in the weekend. And you'd put the event up. And obviously, you know, I'd have, you know, at the time, my original Facebook had like close to 3,000, maybe 5,000 friends, crazy amounts. But, you know, those were all people that I met across college, across sorry, sixth form, university, working in different areas um, of the industry, working in different sectors, working in different companies. You know, I just added it on my lump people. But I remember one time or loads of times, actually, when you send out an event, you get people that would click no and then write on the wall of the event, oh, here's why I'm not coming. And it used to always infuriate me. Like, I was like, number one, I'm not sending this invite to you directly. It's just like a thing that you do on Facebook. And remember, in the beginning, you could just click select all. Then I guess Facebook realized that that would be like a money, um, something they could generate a lot of money from. So they turned it off and then that, you have to get a plug-in or you have to get a special thing. Before you could just, you know, load up your friends, just click select all and just send invite. And then obviously everyone would get the invite in your phone, in your in your contact list or in your friends list. And some people would go out of their way to click no and then write, oh, hey, Egg, thanks for the invite, but I can't go because my mom, because my dad, because my cat, because I, I don't care. I didn't send this to you directly. Just say no if you don't want to go and say yes if you do or just ignore it. It's not that big of a deal. And I guess that goes back to the same thing when people write, you, you know, would write a note rejection to you. It's like they're trying to explain why they don't like you. It's like, no, 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 no. I didn't ask you for an explanation. If anything, this explanation makes it worse. <laughs> just say no and <laughs> let me just continue with life and stuff. So that's what something I realized. But I was thinking about unrepented love. I was thought about unrepented love and how sometimes I have a tendency to maybe um, have it. And to sort of uh, seek validation or seek explanation as to why things weren't the way or aren't the way they used to be. And it's not really none of my business. And sometimes things just change. And regardless of how much it sucks, it just is what it is. And there's nothing you can kind of do about it. And it kind of led me onto this little page on Wikipedia that I kind of you know was researching and looked up um, on unrequented love. And it's got a really interesting quote here, courtesy of Frederick Nietzsche, the famed philosopher, who says the follows indispensable to the lover is his unrequented love which he w would at no price relinquish for a state of indifference i'll read that one more time because i can't read indispensable to the lover it is unrequented love which he would at no price relinquish for a state of indifference so essentially he's saying the pursuit of unrequented love is better than maybe not trying to seek it in at all in the slightest which i think is a little bit of a misnomer because i think the brutality and the pure sick feeling you get in the bottom of your stomach when someone says hey i don't want to be your friend cannot be re repeat cannot be a cannot be copied because i remember having that thing happen to me a few times when i was like a teenager especially growing up in this like really small area and ends with not a lot of people that kind of came out or not a lot of kids that were basically allowed out and there's only a small group of us and then another cooler kid come joins along no an older kid sorry starts hanging out with us who all the kids kind of thought was cooler and for every reason he just didn't take a liking to me then he decided to you know only hang out with those kids by themselves and they didn't want to tell me and then it got to a point where i was like why do i keep having to chase you guys and you know so naive so dumb I didn't realize what was happening. I was like, why do I have to keep chasing you guys? Why don't you just call me when you're out? And he said, yeah, we don't want to be your friend. Like, I remember legitimately like, like an American high school movie, running home, crying, like running home with tears running right down my face, like sprinting, running upstairs, crying in my bed. And of course, my dad came in and gave me some very unsoothing words of advice, like suck it up, be a man. Who cares if they don't like you? But like just really, you know, horrible kind of, you know, um, typical African uncle or African dad sort of like um, words of encouragement that didn't help in the slightest. And I just kept sobbing into my pillow for ages. I was in my room for time. And if anything, that kind of explains, now saying it out loud, out loud <laughs> that might explain how I am nowadays, why I'm so kind of hardened. And, you know, even though I'm still a bit of a big softy on the inside, why I kind of can come across so hardened and I can come across a little bit callous and not necessarily caring about people was opinions or feelings and stuff and sometimes as well have that tendency to i won't even mention i won't even say it's trauma dumping but have the have the kind of necessity to want someone to feel what you're feeling like you know that kind of thing that whatever it may be because it's so visceral in that moment and really it doesn't necessarily matter to that extent and also it's none of your business so going forward in 2023 my new motto is to leave people alone in general 
I think I said it in the beginning of the year. I think overall, don't believe what anyone says. It was a new month of 2023. Take everything what people say at face value. Doesn't matter how severe, how the severity of what they're saying. People in general just love to talk out of their ass. Look what's happening with this George Santos guy. He's like a kind of throwback to the glory years of politicians where they just, you know, they got ahead in life with just pure grift, scumbaggery, and lies. And I think we're kind of in that era now. We're kind of getting to that era where people are just going to be willing to say anything and anything to get forward in life. And it kind of is the name of the game. Who cares? But it's, you have to be aware of it. Be aware of the fact that people in general talk a lot of rubbish and you should never believe them. And again, they don't owe you an explanation. They don't owe you to give you proof or, you know, to, to try and prove you wrong or make them believe you or make, you know, they, they, they don't, you don't need to believe them in any way, shape or form, but don't believe what people say. And then the second thing, leave people alone. Just leave them alone in general. Like focus on you, especially now, considering how the economy is, considering how the world is. If ever there was a time to just focus on you and yours, this is it. There is no reason in my head where I should be trying to, you know, um, recapture some magic that happened long, long time ago. And even then, was it magic? Who knows? Um, reignite this, do this, inform that. There's no reason I should be doing it in the slightest, uh, apart from maybe just me being like emotionally selfish or t t tyrannical or um, uh, whatever else. I don't know. There's something in it, right? Where it's kind of, it kind of feels a little bit greedy. It kind of feels a little bit entitled that you want that person to feel how you want to feel, how you are feeling in that moment where really they're allowed to feel any way they want to because it's their own experience and they interpret it a completely different way than you have and they don't owe you an explanation. But 2023 is definitely, I feel like, the year of leaving people alone. Mind your business, leave people alone, keep your head down, work hard on what you're doing, um, do right by the people near you and that's all you can hope for because in life in general, well, I think most of us know this, but you really don't have a second chance at first impression and sometimes you just don't know how you come across and I'm somebody that kind of has seen that happen to me in real time and I think a lot of it is also self-inflicted for me because I think this, you know, it's probably, you know, it's safe to say the no friends thing is definitely a trauma, right? It's definitely something that I'm burying and I'm kind of working through in ways that are a bit weird. So I went through that horrible time when I was a kid, right? That's just a anecdotal throwaway story of when I was like under 10 years old. It's not, it's dumb really to think about that can affect me so far down in life. But I also think that the lack of day-to-day -day practice of maintaining relationships and being there for somebody and blah, 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 and all that soppy stuff that I don't care for in the slightest definitely affects my ability to see what's actually going on, to hear what someone's actually saying when they say the words that they say, to understand it, to um, have a discernment, right? To be able to uh, perceive and, you know, um, understand something without somebody even saying it articulate that they don't even need to articulate it you can just get it from how they're moving what they're not saying um all those things reading between the lines i'm not really good at it because again i don't maintain the relationship in the slightest and also as another kind of sidebar something again i've kind of learned over the last couple of weeks or so i'm incredibly selfish incredibly so and i think this is something that was drummed home to me a lot when i was at home and i didn't really buy into it because you know your parents talk to you and they say you know my, my, especially my parents they didn't they didn't waste any time reminding me all the things i didn't do right so after a while you're like you know what i'm just gonna zone it out i don't want to listen to it anymore so you don't really listen hear it but one thing i remember them saying a lot to me which i think was definitely true one thing was not, not true they, they said, said to me i was really stubborn and hard-headed which i don't think is true or if anything i think i'm too uh I'm too open to things. I'm too adaptable. I'm, you know, give me more information and convince me on this side. And I can understand every side of the argument. I can be a little bit of a fence sitter in that way. I don't really have one place I kind of stand on. So I don't really think the hard headed, stubborn thing is true. And I'm open to new things, blah, blah, blah. But one thing I remember them saying that's definitely true, definitely, definitely true, is me being selfish. Like me, me believing that my time is like more precious than somebody else's time. Not in the way that I'm like going to try and jump in front of you in the queue because I feel like I have to go in front of you. No, just in terms of like what I want to do. Like if I don't want to do something, I just won't do it. And I think, you know, in, in, you know, in adult life, especially if you want to have friends and you want to have acquaintances and stuff, there are going to come a time and an occasion where you're going to be required to do something that you don't want to do because your friend just needs some support hey i want to buy something like here you want to come down to me and help me out yeah cool i want to go to this place and eat i don't want to go by myself do you want to come yeah cool you know, all these things you're going to do for somebody that don't necessarily 
you know land in your area of interest but you do them because your friend asks you and they want you to you want they want you to help they want basically you to help them out or they want your company right they want to be around you and stuff and want to hang out but i just don't want that you know i want to do the things that i want to do and anything that impedes it is just a distraction and it's not good yeah you know i mean it's not good in the slightest because you end up doing things that i'm obviously not proud of where you end up promising people things and you don't follow through because on the day you wake up you're like i don't want to do it you don't want to give people an explanation because you feel like you don't owe anyone explanation, which then makes, you know, relationships go down the tank. Because I've done that a few times for sure. I've just been like, you know what, I'm just not going to speak to you anymore now. I've just decided because I just don't want to. And that's obviously really bad. And um, yeah, these are all things I've realized in the last couple of days or so. And I think a lot of it, a lot of it, weirdly enough, a lot of it, this is really going to be strange, has come from watching Yellowstone. <laughs> Yellowstone really got me introspective, really got me to dig deep, and really got me to think about so many different things. And why I really like it, and why I think it got me to think that way, and why it's really important as well to think about as I get this picture loaded up on the screen, this is a predominantly, because this is something I need to just echo and just say out loud here, this is a predominantly white show, right? Completely white cast, there's very little, you know, there's, there's very little in terms of like, if you're looking at it purely, purely for an ideological racial lens, there's very little you can identify with all this, right? With the people that are in Yellowstone. But human nature is human nature, right? That's essentially at its core what it is. We all have families. We have relationships. We have dynamics and friendships, workplaces, dreams, aspirations, all these sort of things. And it doesn't matter what you look like. Those are kind of universal truths. And I think for whatever reason, in mainstream Hollywood nowadays, they're so hell bent on representation. They're so hell bent on, you know, ideological, flipping, politically possessed arguments that they forget the story, human nature, the story is kind of universal. And if you tell compelling stories, it doesn't matter who you get to present or play them. It really doesn't matter. And in this cast of people, I'm not going to say everyone in this thing is a flipping Oscar worthy actor. I'm not going to say all the characters in this are very well fleshed out and are interesting. I'm not going to say the plot line is flipping Sopranos level because it isn't, or the storylines. But the stories about relationships, friendships, family um, are just universal truths that anyone can kind of identify with. And I think it really works super well without being too um, cliche. You know, it just kind of operates in that kind of nice little medium and it does really, really well. So I'm a really big fan of it. I've really been enjoying it. I'm not going to lie. I still think the prequels are better, weirdly enough, as stories. I think whatever lessons that you learn, I think, you know, it happens all the time in life. When you do one thing for ages and you go back and you maybe redo it, you know, you think of, a, you know, mock tests or you think of a, a drawing you want to do. The more you do it, the more at ease your hand feels, the more cleaner the lines are, the shapes, the colors, all this stuff. I think the same thing as Yellowstone. Whoever writes, I think it's was it Tim Sheridan or Tony Sheridan, something like that, something Sheridan. You know, you write Yellowstone first and then you start to kind of work out all the kinks and, the, you know, and the things that kind of work out, don't work out. And then when you start writing the prequels, you can kind of correct those things in the prequels. So the prequels are probably a better iteration of Yellowstone, which we, we haven't really seen it done this way, I don't think, in, when it comes to creating a universe. I don't think so. I don't think we've seen people create like a universe that's in the present time and then the prequels come after the fact, but they're kind of sequels. I don't think it's happening that way. And they're obviously creating a really big, expansive universe because there's another one coming about a really famous black cowboy. Um, from back in the day, I think he was an officer. I forgot his name. Uh, there's a really good biographics on him out there at the moment. Biographies, you haven't checked it out. It's a really cool YouTube channel that does really cool biographies on interesting people in history, interesting figures in history. And it's got a, a video on him that I haven't watched yet, but I remember ch checking it out. But there's one in the works now at the moment of a black cowboy that's happening very, very soon. And that's like a real person in history kind of thing, not something they just created just to make black people feel good and stuff. But I feel like it's really, really cool really important if one thing that really kind of touched me on yellowstone was this idea of ownership of land right this idea that the main guy in it um john dutton essentially comes from this dutton family that owns this ranch yellowstone this expansive fields of just grass where cattle and horses and whatnot graze upon and you know they live life and whatnot it's just an incredible incredible kind of place to look at scenically and they've got this amazing house and stuff like just and it's been passed through generation to generation i think it starts with 1883 to 1923 to obviously yellowstone in a sort of like modern times and this idea of ownership is really interesting because there's always this kind of conflicting story about you know, new developments started to come in because at the moment that's what's going for in Yellowstone. 
you know, people are trying to basically take this guy's land from him and build new things there that will probably benefit more people in terms of housing, in terms of jobs and whatnot. Um, you know, a little city in the area that his farm is at. And then there's obviously the other side of things of the Native American or indigenous people that were there before Christopher Columbus bloody arrived who feel like they have ownership of that land because they were the first people on that land. And there's that whole conversation around it. And it got me thinking just in a really anecdotal, naive, 10-year-old kind of way, would we have ever got an iPhone if Christopher Columbus didn't come in and basically commit genocide on you know on the native people that live on those lands like would we would we have had an iphone probably not and that's the brutality that's the brutal honest truth of history the brutal honest truth of history is that people do the unspeakable things to uh take things from people to assert power influence whatever it may be over over, over the course of history and you see that a lot in this year so you see a lot of people dying you see a lot of people getting financially ruined you see a lot of people losing their jobs a lot of people you know a lot of people getting fired a lot of people you know you know committing s word um a lot of people getting off all this stuff happen that happens and it's sort of cool because it's a real reflection of what has happened in history that's the same sort of thing right people would go and sack towns and cities and whatnot and take them over and like you know uh, pillage the town and all word all the wives and stuff and take some people under you know uh, you know basically ownership and make them become slaves really cruel and mean things to get the things that they wanted to protect their own for the interest of their own family that's how brutal that's how brutal those things were back in the day and it happens so often and I feel like Yellowstone does a really good job in sort of depicting that without being too um, cheesy, without indulging you, uh, without, it, you know, infertiling it or making it just, you know, all rosy and all things go well in the end. And I also love the fact that as the cast, nobody in this entire cast of Yellowstone is redeemable. They're all pieces of crap in their own way. Every single one of them, even Casey. Right, the guy that's married to an Indian lady or to a Native American lady and stuff. Essentially, he's always put his family, um, Dutton, in front of his, you know, family that he chose in every shape or in every way, shape or form. And anytime his family does get close to the Duttons, um, something goes terribly wrong for them, and he can't see it for whatever reason. But they get warped into his vortex. And if anything, the family are also like that, right? Anyone that touches that family ends up, you know, something ends up going wrong, but it always kind of benefits the, the Duttons in some way, shape or form. Beth, um, Jamie, like no one in this flipping cast of people is redeemable. None of them. And I think that's what really works well. They're not like black and white characters. They're kind of gray. They've got some good, they've got some bad, but there's no one that you can really get behind and root behind and think, yeah, they're doing the right thing because they're not. Even uh, Beth's husband, a uh, Rip, you can't essentially call him a good guy because he's essentially, if you look at the real brass knucks of it, he's basically a serial killer, <laughs> right? So you can't really kind of call him a good dude either because he's, you know, offs people in the name of the ranch and stuff and takes them to the quote-unquote train station, which is absolutely hilarious. But the entire thing is pretty interesting to watch and I really do understand why it's become so popular because it's probably the only thing on TV that doesn't uh, baby you that doesn't try to preach some political message, that doesn't try and sugarcoat history or make it sanitized in any way, shape or form. It gives it to you in brutal, honest truth. And so far, in the whole five seasons of this show, we've not seen no redemption. There's not been some like big, oh my God, and then the natives took it all back kind of thing. It may be gearing up to it now, but in the five seasons so far, there's been no like, you know, because I think other shows would have done that. They would have immediately made it, okay, the Duttons got ran out of town, they're bankrupt now. Everyone's in prison in orange suits. And now this Native American family have owned, are owning the, uh, that Yellowstone. That's what it would make you feel like. But it hasn't happened. If anything, they've got no redemption. They've had no um, real consequences, you would say, that's kind of changed the course of their life. They kind of get away with everything. And I feel like that's a good you know, reflection of how the world actually is. But they also lose people because, you know, they've lost sons in the process. People that have, them have kind of died and whatnot. And I feel like that's more what I like about Yellowstone compared to Ozark. Ozark, I felt like, especially the last couple of seasons, they annoyed me because I felt like, um, I forgot what their names are, the family, but they don't have any repercussions. Like, why is Wendy, yeah, the bird, the bird family in Ozark, why is Wendy Bird still alive? Like, in any kind of scenario, you know, if the, if you were trying to make it somewhat believable, Wendy Bird would have died time ago because she's been a, you know, unnecessary distraction and an unnecessary kind of anvil 
on the back of whoever Marty, I think, Bird's um, heels are in terms of getting a job done with this cartel. She should have been off long ago or one of the kids or something. There should have been some consequences for that whole family's ineptitude and wanton you know, uh, recklessness when it comes to dealing with those people. But I feel like Yellowstone does a good job of kind of working those real life consequences into things where people around them kind of just die um, in real tragic circumstances. And it happens quite often all the time. And I feel like that kind of makes the show way more interesting. But I really enjoyed it. I think it's really um, fun to watch, really easy to watch. And I could definitely understand the hype around it and all the people kind of going Google Gaga over it. Check out Yellowstone if you haven't already. It's in season five. I think it's like the last, yeah, I think it's split into two, right? Season five, part one and two. Um, I think it goes up to about 10 or 12 episodes. I'm not too sure. But I smashed through the four seasons, obviously, the other day. And I really have enjoyed it so far. So I definitely recommend check it out if you haven't already. Definitely check it out if you haven't already. Next, we're going to mention this, a really cool story, courtesy of the New York Times featuring the one and only Ice Spice, and it's called Ice Spice Broke Out With Munch, Rap's New Princess Is Just Warming Up, you know, Rap Princess is a little bit extreme, but I like the article anyway, and I think the reason why I wanted to mention it first is obviously the photography in it is absolutely special. Um, the legendary John Karamika, uh, sorry, Karamanika wrote it, who, you know, most of you would know from really cool um, hip hop related articles and whatnot. And I also think in terms of um, tastefulness, in terms of creative direction, and in terms of just understanding how to kind of A&R somebody and to kind of introduce them into the market, onto the industry slowly and build them up and actually build a fan base around them and anticipation of their songs. I think whoever's in charge, whoever's involved, Ice Spice has done a really good job. Now, it could just be all her and she's really smart and kind of clocked on. You kind of get the impression reading a little bit of this article that John Carm Carminica, sorry, wrote. It's a really good one in terms of kind of describing her origins, what she's up about. But I feel like in general, we've seen how this has gone wrong in some way, shape, or form. I think Lil Nas X might be probably one of the best examples of it, of maybe the quality of music not matching some of the, you know, attention that he maybe gets online and people kind of, you know, getting sour to him. And maybe another person, you know, somebody that maybe kind of looks like um, Ice Spice. You look at somebody like Lato, you look at somebody like Megan Thee Stallion. There was a lot of, I think, disconnect about the amount of attention they kind of got in the mainstream press and how it was trying to how the record label was trying to have them perceived and what was actually going on in the east streets and outside on the streets and i feel like they've done a really good job with i spice in terms of getting her to be somewhat organic or feel like the conversation around on the internet isn't kind of uh, forced um isn't too heavy-handed it kind of makes sense what she's doing and then in the streets they're doing a good example of it also because she's popping out there's a little viral video going of really viral with her um, doing a little practice thing with this other female artist. I've got a name. I think something princesses or something. Um, they're out on some balcony somewhere in New York or it's a fire escape. And allegedly a fan happened to spot them by coincidence talking. And that's them kind of making their collaboration, which is obviously, you know, it's all part of the marketing scheme. Then there's another thing with her promoting her new EP that just dropped, having all these kind of doppel bang, do, doppel bangers, doppel bangers. They probably do on the bang, but doppel um, gangers of girls, kind of in a similar style to that film Megan, doing dances and stuff outside in New York, where everyone kind of, I think, I think it might be Times Square, if I'm not mistaken, where everyone kind of goes and busks and stuff, where you see the kind of you know fake Supermans and whatnot, and the break dancers and whatnot out there, and she's got all these kind of you know um, fake ice spices with her wig and the style of clothes doing her little dance and whatnot and that's kind of been a little bit of a street team type effort and i feel like it's been a free pronged attack and then obviously doing articles like this in the broadsheets but i thought something was really interesting in the article that i wanted to keep in touch upon that i thought was good was kind of the admission of how she kind of got into the industry and the lack of um lying about you know what happens in this game and i feel like this is something that happens quite often more soon more often than not people don't really want to admit it so I think the article is somewhere around here. Where is it? Uh, 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 uh. Oh, yeah, this one. Yeah. So I think it's her talking about how she got started kind of rapping and whatnot, right? And it was very organic, obviously, because the attention was there online. I think this is kind of something that maybe I'd say Cardi B is maybe suffering from a little bit at the moment because she speaks a lot about her, you know, lack of confidence in putting out music and worrying what people say and whatnot. And for me, I've always felt like Cardi B was never really an artist or a musician in any kind of way, shape or form. She just took advantage or took, you know, took advantage of the opportunity and the attention she was getting at the time when she was on Love and Hip Hop. And obviously being somebody that was, 
you know, for some, for whatever reason, very likable online, especially in the early days. People loved Cardi B. Um, they loved to have her on shows. They loved to kind of clip her, you know, rants and whatnot and the little mannerisms and share them online. And she was kind of somebody that people kind of got behind and rid for. And obviously using that attention to kind of then, you know, segue into some sort of musical career with the help of writers and producers and stuff kind of worked for the first album. But obviously if you don't care for music that way, you kind of realize how difficult it is to follow up such a really good, album like the first one i forgot what it may be so i forgot what it was called some remembrance of peace or something the one with the black and white background and whatnot that was a really good album i think it's the first album to kind of follow that up is going to be very difficult especially if you're not somebody that's intrinsically music inclined so there should be no shame in coming out and just saying hey music if it wasn't for me it was just a hustle like anything else out there in life i i maxed it out i might drop a single or a feature here and there like she's done obviously with the glorilla feature that's obviously doing numbers but there's no need to kind of keep trying to push off to be an artist when you're not sometimes just use the opportunity to kind of progress over there but there's also some people like i spice who kind of got into it just for the attention just for the money just for the clout and then you also kind of find your love for it you kind of find it as a way of an option to kind of share your story to say your piece to be involved in a cultural conversation to express yourself and that's the thing that's the thing you're getting from here so it says here uh but so it says born isis gaston to a black father and a Dominican mother who divorced when she was still a toddler, I Spice has five young half siblings. She'd written uh, poetry and raps since childhood, and her father routinely encouraged her to freestyle with him. We'd be walking to school, and he'd be trying to get me to rap about my day. She recalled. She began writing full songs, and she sorry, she didn't begin writing full songs until 2019, inspired by the breakout wave of Brooklyn dual rappers that included Chef Chi and Pop Smoke, and didn't record any of them until 2021. After a video of her doing a bus it challenge gained traction and she had a brief flotation of extreme virality so i like that admission of basically i heard drill and i thought you know what i can do that and i think a lot of kids probably heard the same thing when you hear drill rappers doing what they're doing soundcloud rappers back in the day swag rappers in general cloud rap whatever it may be there was there was a far it was far more or achievable or possible to do what they were doing as opposed to doing what jay-z rakim nas eminem and you know th that kind of era of rappers were doing back then because that's actually rapping which kind of requires you know a whole different side of your brain it's probably something you may be intrinsically born with we have to work hard to do to achieve but when it comes to rapping like you know any number of these swag rappers out there or soundcloud rappers out there you'd think most people out there who have some cool ideas could probably put it together if they sat down for a couple of days and kind of worked it out and she kind of did the same thing and i also love the fact that the busted challenge was a big deal because i think i think retrospectively we've all known that now but she was that one girl who obviously looked one way and then did the thing you know the busted challenge where you're dancing with sang with tracks playing and then when it drops you bust it and then suddenly you change and you look like you're about to go out to a real swanky restaurant or a nightclub and the contrast was crazy in it because she looked one way and then she looked completely amazing with her hair straight and shit wearing a blue short skirt and a bum flapping in the air but i think only retrospectively we found out that was her i don't think that was part of the promo that's the interesting part so for her it was a good I open and seeing, oh my god, look at the attention I'm getting. This is amazing. This feels great. Look at the amount of followers I'm getting, blah, blah, blah. Let's just try and ramp this up to something else. But for us, the public, we didn't see that until she got famous. It kind of worked. It kind of uh it kind of worked in her favor backwards. You're sort of way to kind of validate her presence online. Oh yeah, she's been around for Ava. Look, I remember this her this is her in this clip. So it worked out that way. And I thought that was pretty cool. Um and then she says here, once that happened, I was like, oh. If I could do it one more time, I'm pretty sure I could do it again, she added. She then went, she then, that's when she knew she could be an, oh, sorry, that's when I knew I could be an artist, I Spice says. Since it got an opportunity, she rushed to complete her first song, the squelchy, tough talking, Brooklyn drill esque bully freestyle. She began writing more tracks, documenting the process, evaluating releasing promo trainers for the each to generate potential enthusiasms. All of her released songs so far have been produced by Riot. The two met when they were studying a communication in Sunny Purchase, where I Spice also played volleyball, as she did at the Catholic high school that she attended in the Bronx. And then, of course, they mentioned, I think, towards the end as well about her being, um, her just being chill. Yeah, anyway, the whole article is cruel. There's another bit of an article too that mentions about her just being chill and understanding things. And I think she also mentions an article saying about how she was hated in the beginning, which was true. I never really understood that, why girls didn't necessarily resonate or like her too tough, which might, you know, maybe you could have some kind of understand it because I imagine most girls would feel 
intimidating because she's probably the girl that a lot of guys would have as friends. But w- that she kind of reminds me of Nicki Minaj in a way. You know, Nicki Minaj has that energy of a girl that a lot of guys would know, but she knows those guys mostly because she's probably friends with every single one of them. But they secretly have always kind of liked her, but they also kind of respect her because she's a good friend. But she's also incredibly hot. So you'd imagine a lot of other girls who are the girlfriends of those guys wouldn't like a Nikki or an Ice Spice because they're the girl that all the boys like because they can, you know, they, they can hang out with the boys and be cool and be girly and they can hang out with the girls and be girly and not kind of, you know, stepping on your toes. But for the girls that are the partners or the wives, it's not something you want because, you know, you never know how in love your man could fall with someone that is if they're hanging out with them in the park or what in the party. But in general, I think her attitude online has been really commendable to see because there was a moment where there was a lot of hate around her i would say a lot of girls didn't necessarily like her and that energy when it gets put out especially with these kind of mean girls online especially on the black side of twitter it can be quite make or break you know what i mean you either kind of turn into a villain that no one necessarily supports forever and ever or you turn into somebody that people kind of are infatuated by i think of like a kiki palmer and maybe like an asian doll being a good kind of contrasting examples of like two people who one side of the internet kind of loves and the other side of the internet kind of absolutely hates but i think i spice has done a really good job in terms of maintaining that but like i said you know from the cover of the new ep that's out at the moment to the approach to marketing and rollout whoever's in charge of doing ice spices work now you deserve a lot of praise if it's her herself big pat on the back to that young lady if it's somebody else involved in that team you deserve a lot of praise because this has definitely um, restored my faith in the music industry in terms of people actually knowing what they're doing because for the most part it feels like a lot of talent gets wasted because there's no one really that can works in the business that knows how to break artists how to bring them through, how to kind of guide them in their career, because it's a long one, I think. You can, you can if you want to, have a long career in music, even if you're just a meme, even if you're just for the moment. You can kind of squeeze a lot out of that kind of small moment and have it segue into other things that can allow you to essentially go through life without having to work a regular job again. I think that's what most people would want, especially if you're this creatively minded. You don't want to be working behind a cashier or behind a desk somewhere. You want to be expressing your art and your creativity in some way shape or form and sometimes the music is just like a gateway in doesn't necessarily mean that's just what you're going to do forever and ever you may go into doing stuff behind the scenes you may still go into owning a bar a club a strip club a hookah spot wherever you might you know may not go into something completely different but it's a kind of good to get your foot in build up some capital build up some rep um, you know get your relationships in check and kind of go from there but i really did enjoy this article I really recommend check it out it's available now in the new yorker it's called ice spice broke out with munch rap's new superstar rap new princess sorry is just warming up check it out if you haven't already check it out if you haven't already next we'll quickly mention this which i thought was absolutely hilarious hilarious because it just shows the lengths people will do for their d-r-u-g-s and this is a story featuring young fucks, so a free young fuck, first of all, free big slime. Hopefully he's able to get out off of that case. And, you know, the allegations against him are hopefully not true. And if they are true, free that man regardless, free that man regardless. But this is quite a crazy story, courtesy of the Daily Mail. It says the following. Rapper Young Fug is accused of doing a drug deal in court as he faces 20 years in prison um, for being part of the street gang Young Slime Life. It says an astonishing video footage captured at the moment. Troubled rapper Young Fug allegedly concocted a drug deal in court while sitting just feet away from the prosecutor. The star is seated next to the attorney when his co-defendant Khalif Adams walks over, drops something into his hand in a dramatic courtroom surveillance footage obtained by WSB TV. Prosecutors claim the two exchanged Percocet pill in a motion filed by Fulton County Atlanta are you absolutely kidding me this is the video of the actual um exchange itself let's play it i think it's coming up now i think this guy may be being searched yes yeah, if someone gets up now i think they dropped something on the floor right is it not that's him yeah, yeah. there you go just something right <laughs> oh my god absolutely crazy absolutely crazy it continues 
Um, it says young Fugger's real name is Jeffrey Lamar Williams is facing 62 charges relating to the participation in the criminal street gang Young Son Life. If convicted of Grammy Award winning um, This Is America rapper will be jailed for up to 20 years. Bailiffs were standing close by as they watched the drug deal unfold and quickly swooped in. The deputies then searched Adams, who was already serving life without parole sentence for murder, and found him in possession of a Percocet, marijuana, and tobacco wrapped in plastic and food seasoning to conceal the odor. Percocet is a Schedule 11 opiate, but it's still not illegal, so, you know, it's hard, I guess, to convict this sort of stuff. A photo is reported to have taken Adams to a nearby Grady hospital after he appeared to ingest other items of contraband he had on him. Jury selection has paused on Wednesday as a result of the deal. Um, a motion that the court read defendant Adams who is currently serving life without parole sentence for murder conducted a hand to hand drug transaction with defendant Jeffrey Williams in open court but Adams attorney dismissed the allegations in a statement to Atlanta Journal he said these allegations are simply that mere statements made by the state in an effort to thwart the length of the jury section process Miss Adams adamantly maintains innocence and looks forward to conclusion of his day in trial um, Keith Williams attorney of Williams said the state's motion to repeal um, the factual inaccuracies and embellishments and attempts to make Williams responsible for someone else's actions. The end result of the investigation to win, into Wednesday's actions was that Williams was not engaged in any wrongdoing. The trial of Williams and 13 others expected to last until six to nine months. The gang faces charge of racketeering conspiracy to participate in criminal street activity as well as activity of a drug and gun charges. Jurisdiction was paused on Wednesday shortly after alleged contraband handoff. It comes as the trial has already been plunged into chaos by the laser jury selection, blah, 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 blah. So this got me thinking in general about the lo the kind of lengths I've gone to secure the, the drugs when I've been out and stuff. And for me in general, I think one of the really saving graces of my life, I think overall, is the fact that coming up, I never really was exposed to kind of drugs and alcohol until very late in my life. And I think that's really been a saving grace. And I have to thank my parents for taking me to church when I was really young. I went to church from like the ages of like, you know, zero um, by force all the way until maybe 18, 21 ish. Right. Those all those years are spent every single weekend was spent in church so there was no time to go to clubs there's no time to go to bars there's no time to go to festivals it was all church 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 and when it came to the summertime um there'd be like you know summer events like fest there'd be something like conferences and there'd be like kind of youth events i'd go to and then there was a period of time where i was the unofficial photographer for the people that we used to hang around in church so people used to like look forward to me coming because i'd take cool pictures of them and all this sort of nonsense so there was always 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 church was the kind of you know um underlying factor that kind of defined most of my social goings out and whatnot so when it came to drugs and alcohol i was only exposed to it really late when i then decided to pull away from church and decided to live a somewhat secular life you know a life of debauchery and excess and greed and whatnot and want on behavior that's when I suddenly started drinking and whatever. And I think I mentioned it beforehand. Like my first drink was probably had, you know, cronily and cheesy and lamey enough. The first drink I probably had was at a private view or like a, like a flipping pirate, sorry, uh, protein studio type event where some company doing some activation for some bullshit drink that no one cares about or some new product that no one's going to buy or brand activation for Nike, Umbro, Reebok, Adidas, whatever. That was probably one of the first times I ever had alcohol in my entire life where they were giving out free red stripes and whatnot. Back in that, they said, well, usually it would be free red stripes or Kynikens and whatnot. And then you'd just be down in them and getting absolutely lit. And those are the times I'd probably get drunk the first few times. And then when it came to drugs, that usually started a couple of years, maybe after the fact, when I started to get into like, you know, dance music and electronic music, when I started DJing, when I started going to techno parties and traveling and whatnot, then suddenly the whole drug idea about it was really interesting. But then also the drug part of it for me kind of tied into how miserable i was growing up for a period of time because i just wasn't doing the things i wanted to do and maybe home life was a mess, bit messed up i wanted to kind of you know um, unplug from regular society and the best way to do it was to get super hammered get super high so that you wouldn't kind of remember what is going on in your day to day so you kind of forget about it and it's kind of a horrible way to kind of deal with issues of course but that's something that i kind of did on the regular but in the moment my life started to get I started to get my life back under some level of control. I started to do the things that I was enjoying. I started to pursue maybe a bit of a career, a bit of a passion. Suddenly the need to have those 
extracurricular things happen on the weekends and whatnot wasn't that important anymore and even more so when i moved out and i started living by myself it was more so a thing of like now i have the opportunity to drink and do drugs as much as i want and i'm not doing it as much as i was doing it back then because back then it was like a naughty thing that i couldn't do and i was at home all the time blah 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 so for me there's never been a point in time where i could ever come to this point of addiction or necessity or need where I'd be wanting to do a drug deal in open court whilst I'm facing 20 years. It's not something I'd even think about. It wouldn't come in my head because I've got so much going on. Um, uh, so um, I've, I had, you know, I didn't have the experience of, you know, having a, you know, having a drug addiction in that shape or shape or form or having a dependency. And also, I never really cared that much. It was never that important. Like, for instance, there'll be times where I'd go out and I wouldn't have gear and I'd be uh, bummed about it. But it wouldn't mean I wouldn't go out. I'd still go out, but it wouldn't be maybe as fun as I would want it to be. Whereas I know some people would be like, hey, if I don't have the gear, I'm not going anywhere. I just kind of suck off the whole night. It was never that serious. And most of it was just kind of me trying to escape from my day-to-day reality in the moment. My day-to-day reality improved. Suddenly the drug needing wasn't that important. But I do remember there being some times, you know, where you've done some unthinkable things. Like I remember one time in life when, we were obsessed or I was obsessed with flipping doing MDMA all the time every weekend and it was horrible imagine I can't now the smell and the taste of it makes me bath and I want to vomit but back then I'd, I'd, I'd kind of run through three and a half grams on my own on the weekend and if anyone knows anything about MDMA you'll know that you know it's got a lot of highs but when you come crashing down on the Monday or the Tuesday that that kind of temporary depression is real and you feel so horrible I remember one time kind of texting my friend at the time and asking him like what the fuck's going on man i feel so down i feel so low i feel so there's no i was like on a real nihilist black pill type of mood i feel like there's no point to life and whatnot We're wasting our time all this stuff like we should all just hurry up and die like having some really dark thoughts <laughs> i don't know mate just saying something so matter-of-factly that kind of just opened it up to me he's like yeah mate i'm not surprised you're flipping running through you know an ounce of flipping um md every weekend what do you expect i was like oh and I straight away went to Google, typed it in, you know, side effects of MDMA. You realize, oh, that dopamine hit doesn't just go all the way up. It goes down too. I was like, ah, and then I realized that was happening. And then soon after, I kind of stopped doing that altogether. I haven't done it, I don't think, seriously, many, 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 many years. If anything, I'd probably prefer doing a pill over doing a flipping bag of MDMA and having that in my hand and dabbing my finger all day long or pouring in a drink. Like, that's absolutely long. But I remember I used to do it so often. Anyone that knows me back in that day would know I'd be handing out MDMA for like a flipping, like flipping seat, like, like Santa Claus. You know what I mean, that's how bad it was getting. And then, of course, in those periods of time, well, this will be a time where I'll be out. Nowadays, I can't even fathom it. But I remember back then, it'll be around the times when you'd be out and about. And for some reason, you'd be in a club. And, you know, whatever reason people are smashing their high, they might drop something. And someone would drop something on the floor. And sometimes you'd use it in the same way how back in the day, we'd sometimes do the thing called, well, I think they called it like landmining or something where you'd go around pubs and whatnot and you'd see somebody left a drink that they forgot about and you'd kind of drink it because at that time you were a broke sort of like art student, you know, struggling to get by, but you still went to get drunk and lit. So you'd kind of be picking up drunks that just left, left by it. But, you know, the, the, you never know what it was in there. It could be urine. It could be apple juice. It could be anything, but you do that. And I remember there was a time too that you'd pick up drugs on the floor. Imagine how risky, dumb, and idiotic that is to do drugs that somebody drops on the floor that you have no idea what they are and you do them and just kind of hope for the best kind of in a pure Joey Diaz type of way. And I remember doing that often. And again, then I remember doing it because I was in my haze of like, you know, going crazy. But now that I'm older and I have things going on and I've access to stuff that I can get whenever I want it, it would never cross my mind in the slightest. Ever, 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 ever cross my mind to ever do that. But I remember doing it before and being really, really lit. Uh, but yeah, what an amazing, what an amazing, scary time that was. But I am thankful, like I said prior, that I had that experience in church because I feel like it really did save me. So I feel like if I started early, like these other guys or like most people do, you know, who maybe do their first line when they're 13, their first pill when they're 12 or something, their first drink when they're 15. And, you know, you guys have a lot of, I respect you guys more that you, if you decide to quit or to kind of pull it back because you got addicted to it so young. You know what I mean? And then to kind of pull away from that and not be interested in it later on in life is pretty difficult. But I was, I think, lucky in that I started it quite late in life. And also, not even just church, it was also sports. Because at that time too, I was skating a lot. 
I was playing a lot of football and not football just by myself like football I was part of a team where people depended on me so you had to go to training you had to turn up for matches on Sunday so you couldn't go too crazy I had these I always had these rail guards in my life whether it was church or football or friends and stuff that kind of didn't allow me to go over the, over you know too crazy because I had to turn up somewhere. I had to go to church on Sunday, Sunday football. I had to go play football at the cage. All these things were kind of around. I went to go to a skate park thing, whatever. Maybe there was a demo happening. There was just kind of, you know, a private view, whatever. You went to be on your P's and Q's because you never know who you might bump into. All those things kind of played into my mind of things that were kind of keeping in place there that was kind of making sure that I wasn't going to go crazy. But again, I feel like my side of things is far easier than the person, you know, I remember one time going to a house party and bumping into some really cool dudes who actually, I'm actually still, you know, social media friends with some kids from Scotland who were telling me about how crazy the drugs are up there and it made a lot of sense because they're basically saying hey like you know where we are from in scotland it's a really small town and not a lot of people but most of the kids over there when they reach 18 to 21 the first thing they do is move to a bigger city whether it's london or anywhere else in the middle of you know in the north of flipping england but one thing they will do a lot of those kids in those small towns in scotland was do drugs because there was legitimately nothing to do in their area they couldn't drink they couldn't go to most establishments so they basically were just you know reclined to doing drugs in you know abandoned buildings or outside in parks or in people's houses whoever had a cool mum and my people hanging out but they were starting them super easy super early so i remember one kid telling me at that house party saying that you know i think it's from scotland oh they started doing pills and like pingers when they were like you know under the age of 15 legit under the age of 15 so i remember him saying his tolerance was super high like he could do four and not feel not feel a thing and I was thinking, wow, that would be scary if that would be me. So if anything, I respect and honor that person more because they started earlier and they still have a healthy relationship with drugs and alcohol or they completely abstain from it later on. Because it does happen, isn't it? When you start those things so early and then, you know, you're now 21, 22, 23, 24, when everyone's getting excited about going festivals because it's the first time they're allowed out, it can look a bit corny and cheesy because you've already done it. It's like kids who grew up around parents who went to Glastonbury and Boomtown and all these other things when they were younger and stuff and Coachella and, you know, and Burning Man. It's a bit difficult to get super hyped about certain things because you've been around it for so long. Your parents have been doing it. If anything, you probably see it as corny. Imagine that there's kids growing up nowadays who think festivals and going out is corny and lame because their parents do it. Even though their parents are young and cool parents who go to Primavera, who go to Boom, Boomtown, like I mentioned, you go to all these kind of really cool festivals but because the kids have seen their parents do it and seen them come back monged out you know flipping with uh, cds for eyes and stuff they're like i'm never going to be that person so it kind of you know puts them off but for me i had a little deliance about it it went the way it went it was okay for a period of time i left it i ever appeared if i can mention also was um there was a period in time where, again, looking back on it, it might sound strange, but there was a period in time where I was really friendly with this particular drug dealer that used to hang out with us, and we'd go and pick up drugs from him directly at his house. That's how much he liked us as friends, because he used to hang out with us in our social group, but he just kind of paying for the gear. And, you know, he'd go into his house, and he'd literally have, like, bricks of this stuff in there in his bedroom and it kind of looked like stuff that you see in maybe narcos and stuff and you'd be breaking off you weighing on the scale and whatnot and it was just really really cool about it and it was really funny really odd to kind of think about that being a thing of like you would go to his house and pick up stuff and just be casual about it and just be whatever before you'd go out and it'd be like a constant thing you'd do but you didn't know that you actually going to a trap house at the time it's all oh, it's just his house like no this is a trap house like many illicit and horrible things have happened in, uh, in these four walls but you're just trying not to think about it because you want to get off and do your thing when it comes to the weekend and then by the time i'll get the bag you'd be burning a hole in your pocket before you get to the station you don't want to take it before you arrive and go to your friends because you won't be on the same kind of high absolutely crazy but those are the only times i can remember it but then after a period of time when i started making more money and i started to kind of have a little bit more going on in life the necessity to get super black town to get super drunk all the time and to get super high kind of faded and then you know it kind of became like a whenever situation whenever it happens it happens sort of thing and also the access to it kind of improved especially with stuff like darkening and all this sort of stuff happened it kind of made the access to it easier and for me i felt like maybe you guys are different but i felt like like i, f I felt like my consumption of like chicken and chips was super high back in the day when uber and just eating stuff didn't exist or delivery didn't exist when i used to live in ed and i'd have five pound burning hole in my pocket and i was a little bit hungry the first thing i do is walk three minutes outside of my house because you know especially growing up in canning town custom house the only thing in that area that there is was flipping betting shops and chicken shops that's it betting shops and chicken shops are the only things you know in those kind of you know uh, deprived working class poverty stricken areas 
so there'd always be a chicken shop within like a stone's throw of you so the first thing you do is just go and buy chicken chips whenever you felt any pang of hunger or your belly rumbling but then as soon as delivery and Uber Eats came about i have access to thousands and thousands of restaurants with all sorts of food and i hardly use it maybe on a weekend here and there but it's not something i run to every time i'm hungry i'd rather sometimes make something at home like oh, you want to waste the money on delivery i mean it kind of it's a bit it works counterintuitively for me in that way same thing when it came to drugs at the moment drugs became readily available on darknet and i could order it whenever i want suddenly i stopped doing it as much because it's there all the time and there's no rush do you know what i mean it kind of took away the onus of it so i can't imagine what it must be like to be on the other side of things where you're needing it that much that you're willing to do an open drug deal in court while you're facing 20 years and also on the back of it think of it too when young thug is in this situation i actually think looking at the pictures of him being in court he looks the healthiest he's ever looked in a very long time and you only have to look at some old videos of him i was checking a recent video um so it went kind of viral again on on social media of him interviewing with tim westwood for the first time and i think it was when he was here for wireless i think i'm gonna say maybe he was here for wireless and tim westwood is interviewing him in his trailer and he looks really cracked out like you don't realize how dope fiendy and skitty and skittish young fuck look back in the day until you watch these videos and interviews of him back in the day same with little baby how he used to talk how he used to carry himself like he looked so strung out but you know at that time it just seemed like you know young thug eccentric you know character a bit different a bit out of the box but now if anything he looks far more healthy far more clean but imagine you know he's probably been a long-term drug addict for a really long time for, you know for you know for the most of his life and then he's actually every single everything he's been spending and you know a long period of time sitting down in jail without any of those things so the first thing he wants to do is obviously to get lit and get high but i can't ever imagine you know risking adding more time to my sentence and doing stuff like that in open court the only thing he's obviously okay with is the fact that an opioid isn't illegal obviously you know it is what it is what he's doing in court but it's not like a class a substance so he's not obviously that crazy do something like that but i just thought that story was absolutely crazy and regardless and i'm happy that i never had that relationship with drugs and it wasn't something that kind of gripped or followed me in that way shape or form i'm really 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 fortunate i gotta be honest i'm really fortunate not something I take for granted in the slightest. Not something I take for granted in the slightest. I think when we talk about this, I think it's really interesting. Have you seen this? This is a story that's really been doing the rounds as people have been kind of going crazy about. And it kind of beggars belief uh, for me. And it kind of defies all real logic. Because this is something I don't notice in the slightest. Because for the most part, when I'm in these establishments, I'm legitimately minding my own business. I don't care what the hell is going on around me. I'm just focusing my workout and there's this video here that's went viral featuring this young lady on tiktok where she's doing this workout that i think you know universally all girls seem to love the one where you put the barbell um in the crevice of your legs and you kind of rest back on the bench and you kind of do these thrust with the flipping um with the barbell loads of girls tend to like it i'm assuming it's a good ab back and butt exercise whatever it may be if you love girls doing it for the most part but She's in this gym doing her workout and, you know, changing her plates and do what she's doing. And there's a guy in the corner of the gym who keeps maybe glancing over to her as she's working out. And she's kind of narrating it and saying, oh, this guy's being creepy. Um, this is what women get in gyms. We have no peace. All these men are over us all the time. Uh, you know, they can't just leave us alone. And it kind of, you know, it's kind of said through the lens of he's being a predator whilst I'm just minding my business, which obviously isn't what's happening if you actually watch the video. But let's play the clip anyway and hear what she has to say. And approach girls at the gym. I hate this. I hate this. I hate when there's sweaters. It's me so uncomfortable. Feral, 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 feral. Like fucking feral. There's mirrors everywhere, so it's like you can easily ca catch people. Act. Oh, this is nothing. And as she's doing this, she's kind of doing the thrust in the gym. There's obviously a text that says above that says stare counter as how many times this guy is staring at her in a public gym, which is absolutely insane to be honest. Because, you know, when I'm minding my business, doing my reps, when I'm in between reps, I might scan across and look what people are doing, but I'm not staring at you. We're in a public space. I'm looking at you. I'm looking who's around me. It's not staring at anybody, but regardless, let's just play. Okay, we're going to move on to the 35 now. I want you to watch very carefully. He looks again, stair counter three. He looks again, stair four. Five as. Five. Excuse me? 
You don't have to do that. It's okay. No, no, it's okay. I got it. Thank you, though. He was only working out behind me to go behind uh, to go up to me because I was at the squat recall and the way he came over to the gym to avoid weirdos like this. So she's basically, from what I can see, it looks like he's trying to help her out with the plates because if anybody's actually been to the gym and used these kind of Illico strength, whatever, power plates, they're all the same, these kind of colored plates, they're kind of hard to get on in general. And in some places, they'll have like little winches or little wedges that you can put underneath the barbell. Some people would put actual little plates under the plate, sorry, that you're obviously using so you can kind of lift and pull the plate on and off. But they're pretty cumbersome. But after a while, you get used to your little technique of what you do. I usually kind of go over them standing like kind of over the plate with the plate under both my legs. And I kind of slide them out and hold up the plate and get the other players on the floor and slide it back on but it still takes a little bit of effort and obviously if you're new to gym or you haven't got a lot of strength put another plate on that you want to lift you know it's probably a lot harder on your arms than it would be to kind of lift the plate up and down you know through your crutch whatever you're doing so it's a common thing and some people will go around and help you if, if they look like you're struggling it's not that big of a deal really this is how to not a and then um of course let's just uh let's quote this and see what people are saying online uh, 100% some people are saying 100% this dude is thinking when is this chick going to get done with the hip thrusting 900 pounds on the deadlift platform I need to use this my thing for my training because maybe he was yeah maybe that it's actually looking back on it that, she is not a deadlift platform isn't she yeah true and usually in most gyms there's not a lot of deadlift platforms those are usually the platforms with wooden you know kind of plank with a wooden platform with sometimes some rubber or some carpet on either side to kind of absorb the sound of the flipping weights and some people want to use them to do you know whatever else they want to do so that could be a situation. Another person says here, and people wonder why there's been eclipse in dating, marriage, and fertility rates, etc. Uh, she's delusional. Her opinion of herself is so high that if a man even glances her way, she must want her. He needs to take a step back and think about how much delusion is putting men in danger. The guy is simply waiting to use the equipment. Someone says here, this woman should be ashamed of herself for this video. And another person says here, this is why I just look at the floor in the gym. Women be trying to ruin dudes' lives for content. Which is true. In general, when it comes to me being in gym, especially if it comes to the opposite sex, I tend to just, you know, keep my eyes to myself because everyone's got their own little world that they kind of live in and you never know what situation or experience that person's coming from. But I think to approach every situation with bad intent or to assume the worst of people all the time is a little bit weird. But in a way, I can kind of understand it if you're a woman because in general, you can't really risk giving somebody the benefit of the doubt, especially if they're a guy and they're triple, quadruple the size of you. Sometimes giving them the benefit of the doubt could legitimately cost you your life. So you kind of have to be wary of everybody. I think if I had a daughter, I'd say the same thing. Right? I'd say, hey, don't trust any dude out there until they gain your trust or any person, you know, for that way, shape or form. Like they have to gain your trust before you give it to them because obviously with you being smaller and you being a girl, you're, you can't, don't have the ability to kind of, you know, even that person does... Uh, stab you in the back let's say you don't have the ability to kind of physically turn that situation around you kind of have to use your p's and q's to not be in that situation in the first place so that requires a lot of like discernment understanding street smarts and maybe assumptions and stereotyping and risks and you know risk evaluation that can sometimes be off and be a bit wrong it kind of is what it is but there is a definitely a population of some girls that go to gyms that for whatever reason feel as if like every guy in there is a predator and wants to rape them which is legitimately some of the most insane kind of ways of thinking I've ever seen in my entire life. Like you should be free to wear what you want, to do what you want with no one actually caring. And for the most part, I can't, again, I go to gym a lot. I go sometimes six days a week and I go sometimes on early mornings, like before 9 a.m. I'd go after 12 p.m. I'd sometimes go after 6 p.m. So I'd go across, you know, most hours of the day that cover the most amount of people that go to the gyms. And I honestly can count on one hand the amount of times I've seen a guy who I can maybe recognize isn't familiar or knows a woman they're about to speak to and try to approach them in some sort of like chat up, hey, what you saying type of thing. I've never seen it. I've seen guys looking from afar, but you can look at somebody not in a gym outside too. You can see somebody with a big bum, with huge tits, with a nice face, great lips, whatever it may be, and a great walk and think, oh, they look great. And just look, you're allowed to look at people. That's not a crime. Um, but I've not seen anybody legitimately come up and try and be pervy and try and linger and try and get someone's attention in gym in my life. It's never happened. Literally, I can maybe count it happening on one time in my hand, legit. And the person that you do see doing it 
is a person that you can imagine doing. It's no surprise when you see them. Okay, that, that seems like the kind of guy that would do that kind of thing. They'd be hanging around, you know, exercising next to a girl, trying to show off to get her attention, offering unsolicited advice, offering tips on how to do this, how to do that, asking questions about what they're doing, what they're wearing, all that sort of weird stuff. It happens a lot, a lot in gyms, um, you know, with those kind of dudes. But in terms of seeing you often, I don't see it. It's not something that happens. Most people are really minding their business. And again, I don't know about you guys, but I've seen a real uprising in people going to gyms, myself included, with noise cancelling headphones on. I don't even have regular earphones. I have noise cancel. I don't hear jack crap. Right? I'm just banging my music in my ears, listen to Baby Drill on max volume, not caring about anything else that's going on around me. So it, it, thinking about how to say something and approaching somebody and being cheeky and being whatever is not the way forward at all. It's never, ever going to happen. And don't get me wrong. It is a bit annoying, even though she's doing you know, a, a workout that I think is a bit cringe. But still, I can't say it be any bit annoying when you're working out and you feel like somebody's lingering around you. But unfortunately, you're in a public gym and we have to share all these bits of equipment. And sometimes the equipment that you want to use is usually the most popular. I can think of stuff like the platform, sorry, the bench, the deadlift platform, um, the squat rack, uh, bench press, some some free weights or the benches in general. All these things are things that people want to use on a daily basis, hourly basis. Some people are coming down with really tight deadlines and whatnot and just want to get their workout in and kind of bounce. And some people kind of use gyms like libraries. I remember back in the day when I used to go to libraries or to a library and you see random people just on their phone chilling, watching something on their laptop because they use the opportunity to go and relax and hang out before they maybe go home or whatnot. And some people do the same thing in gyms. They want to be going to a place where they can maybe not have distractions on them talking to them. You can be on your phone, you can watch a video, watch a form thing. But some people want to use equipment. So you have to kind of have that give and take. So sometimes people lingering, they're not lingering for you. They're lingering to make you realize that they're waiting so that you can hurry up and get off the equipment so they can, they can use it. And you have to be kind of, you know, conscious and aware of that. But some people just aren't and they kind of, you know, live in this world where they're always a the main character, which is kind of what this is giving a little bit, that she's sort of the main character in this sort of movie. But I think in general, a common rule for all guys, I think, because there are some videos that go viral of some guys going over to a girl. I don't know if some of them are thick, are kind of, you know, um, stuff that is purposely a skit but there are some videos that exist of dudes going up to girls and having a good interaction about form and technique and whatnot and it turning into a date that can happen i'm sure but that's like a disney movie i think for the most part you should leave people alone really leave everyone alone. like i said in the beginning of the podcast leave everyone alone mind your business especially in the gym you have to worry about so many things in the gym like the amount of times i've dropped plates on my big toe and i've had whole entire toenails come off i've had toes go black i'm having excruciating pain um you know not not lifting with correct form so that you you, you know you pull your back muscle you have a spasm all these things happen so i would not risk all those things happening just to get the attention of somebody or talk to a girl you, we see girls every day you see girls all the time it's not that serious of an issue leave them alone um if it's meant to happen it will happen organic in a way it's meant to happen but this idea of going to gyms to try and attract and you know pull somebody is really cringe and i think in general with girls having their backs up in general going to gyms or, or, you know in yeah i think girls in general have their backs up going to gyms you would imagine because they probably feel a little bit especially if you're not used to working out you kind of scantily clad, you're bare in terms of showing a lot of skin because you have to go to the gym. Um, you kind of feel a little bit awkward doing what you're doing. So maybe that's an issue. And in general, you're kind of, you know, around loads of testosterone, loads of real kind of wannabe, you know, uh, trying to approach alpha male status energy around there. Right? There's a lot of masculinity in there. So I can imagine it being maybe a bit of a turn off for some girls that they want to not really be a part of. I can completely get that. But thinking all dudes in gyms are predators is really bad and sometimes some guys just want to help you out sometimes some guys are just trying to get your attention so that you can maybe hurry up and get off the equipment and sometimes some guys just bored and just want to have a talk and you can you know you're free to tell them what you want but don't always assume that it's bad intentions behind it but again everybody needs to leave everybody alone that's the main part of the story for me everybody needs to leave everybody alone Next, we have this really funny clip for courtesy of Complex and a few other places. I'll put it up. It's a clip taken out of a 60 Minutes interview with Rick Rubin. I think they basically follow him around and ask him certain things about his life and whatnot. And I feel like his answer regarding kind of what he does and his profession and stuff has kind of garnered some negative reactions out there on the interwebs of people thinking, you know, 
This guy essentially is a bit of a grifter, a bit of a chancer. He gets paid to basically do nothing. The legend of Rick Rubin, you know, happens all the time, I think, on social media because everyone's, you know, we kind of all become aware and conscious of certain things. We look back on certain people and think to ourselves, hold on, what did you actually do? Why are you kind of, you know, um, revered? Why do why are you respected and praised and loved when the thing that you did wasn't really that impressive if you actually look at it properly? I think the same thing is happening with kind of Rick Rubin. The legend around him and everything, it's kind of being whittled and kind of pulled away and pulled apart, especially in this world we're living in now given how people are struggling that there's a guy out there who essentially doesn't do anything in terms of playing an instrument or arranging tracks but is credited with putting together some of the greatest albums and you know in the history of music which is absolutely insane but there's also a need for it and obviously a need for that conversation of highlighting people out there who have somehow been able to turn their lifestyles into a job and that's something that i remember um getting and feeling inspired by and driven by when i first got into streetwear in the scene was listening to someone like an aaron bondaroff the owner or the founder of a new york thing former model of supreme and you know connected with the scene and whatnot did the no wave gallery did no wave radio did the oh wow gallery back in the day now i think it's called moron and moron or something whatever it may be called um just an all-round cultural cool dude and i remember one of the things he used to say when he was when he was kind of you know doing interviews online was oh turn your lifestyle into a job and i remember he said it during i think a hair and pressing interview actually one time i don't know if he's still got a video up on his channel or not maybe he does maybe he doesn't but that would be a thing that i remember always thinking about like turning your lifestyle into a job and that would always be the dream which is why when i was coming up actually let me play a video of rick rubin speaking then i'll tell you about what i was thinking coming up because i'm just rambling here let me play a video of rick rubin here saying what he's saying regarding his position in the music industry do you play instruments barely do you know how to work a soundboard no i have no technical ability and i know nothing about music <laughs> you must know something well i know what i like and what i don't like and i'm i'm decisive about what i like and what i don't like so what are you being paid for? The confidence that I have in my taste and my ability to express what I feel has proven helpful for artists. What an incredible thing to say at the end, isn't it, right? My confidence in my taste level. And I feel like to me, this is the reason why when I was coming up in the scene in the industry, for better or worse, why I was never, ever, ever, ever infatuated or you know um misty-eyed or bug-eyed when i saw somebody who worked for nike who worked for id mag who worked for some big advertising corporation or company that never really got me because i came into this thing having my idols and people i look up to being guys like hiroshi fujiwara nigo james jebbia aaron bondorov chris gibbs at union these are people that i kind of looked up to um what's his name um jun takahashi uh, the guy from Visvim, I forgot his name, but kind of escapes me now. All these people are the ones that are kind of looking at as people that are wanting to emulate and kind of be a part of, not the flipping marketing manager at Nike. As good as a cool job that is, that's never something that kind of really appealed to me. But one thing I do remember being very interesting about coming up in the scene is that a lot of those people in those kind of middle management positions, those kind of like entry, not middle management positions, but they kind of acted like they were gatekeepers, acted like they were bigger than what they were. They had this really thing that was really annoying where they tried to, um, purposely try to mystique their occupation and make it seem it was more complicated than what it actually was when really they were just you know they worked retail they worked in the office you know helping out marketing they were doing some brand stuff they maybe helped with some app stuff whatever it may be called their weekend stuff stockroom stuff there's not a problem but when you do it for a cool brand people can sometimes play up to be more than what it actually is and again just because you work for Luebe or you work for Louis Vuitton or you at these stores doesn't necessarily mean you're part of the brand that's actually designing the things that they're designing or you're part of the head office thing but sometimes you can feel that kind of weird sense of ownership and pride that you're actually making creating these things when you're obviously not so it can kind of be a bit weird but these guys will purposely kind of do that kind of false kind of thing that they'd be throwing out to make it seem like there was something that they actually weren't and it always used to grate me and piss me off but I also do remember never being enamored or kind of um, fooled by that and knowing that the real power players, the real people that are really putting it together, the ones at the top, the ones I idolized, I spoke about the Hiroshis, the Nigos, um, the James Jebbias and whatnot. Those are the guys I kind of looked up to and thought, yeah, you guys are really putting down. The ones in the middle were just kind of doing whatever they're doing. And then I remember one time 
I went to Nicaragua to go visit a friend and kind of hang out and have a holiday. I remember going to the city of Leon and bumping into a couple of guys in the hostel who were basically at that time um, working from home. So working remotely and they were able to kind of do that whole kind of uh, digital nomad lifestyle before it was popular before it got popularized and i remember kind of getting introduced to that whole kind of lifestyle um about creating a muse and generating income while you sleep and drop shipping all that sort of stuff through tim ferris when you first read the four hour work week that was kind of the premise around the four hour work week was it wasn't just work four hours a week the premise behind it was that create a muse or a business that generates a level of income that can cover all your basic necessities so that you can use the other time outside of the four hours that you're working per week to check in on certain things and do some admin to do the things you actually enjoy that's basically the premise of the book like to actually that was actually self-actualization in a book really if you think about it to pursue language learning because it's a bit about language learning about salsa dancing weightlifting um, doing other other athletic sports pursuits and whatnot because you had all this free time to do those things and your time wasn't clogged up on doing flipping you know working nine to five and whatnot but i remember those guys i bumped into in that hostel in nicaragua being so coy like they were so cool so chill so friendly so accommodating so fun but the moment you try to like peer in and ask them about their job and what they were doing how they did it they would immediately clam up and close up and it made sense now looking back at it at the time i couldn't understand like, why didn't you just tell me why didn't you tell me why didn't you tell me but at that time it was so fresh so new they were probably dominating the entire market living an extremely amazing life back then you know this is back when you could travel to america for under 500 pounds they were probably traveling and living all these different places brexit wasn't here so you could go and live in different parts of europe for an unspecified amount of time without telling anybody and uh, reporting back or anything and come back when you wanted to like things were good back then right and they were living it and enjoying it. So obviously, they didn't want everyone to know. So they were kind of gatekeeping a little bit. But I was thought, oh, this is unfair. But this is what they were doing from back then. Uh, but they were, again, making it a little bit mystical, making it seem a little bit bigger than what it is. But at the core, they were doing remote working and hot desking and um, what's that word called? And being a digital nomad back then before it was actually a thing. And, you know, having these drop shipping businesses that didn't require them to be in a physical location in any way, space or time. As long as they had a laptop, a phone even, and some Wi-Fi, they were Gucci. And that's something they were obviously kind of getting paid for in kind of making businesses' lives efficient and whatnot. But then later on in life, when I started getting to the scene, I started to also find out people in the scene who were essentially getting paid for their taste level. They were getting paid because um, people trusted their opinion on certain things. People trusted their outlook on certain things, their knowledge, uh, their research ability, their ability to connect dots and put things together. All these things were stuff that back then I didn't realize that you could actually monetize and you could get some level of monetary gain from you could gain from it from a career from a network standard point of view and build your network and friendship groups off of that and kind of segue that into other situations but these are things you didn't know back then you had to kind of go through it and i feel like rick rubin is probably the the, the final boss level of that kind of level of thing of like just being somebody that gets paid for their taste level and says you know he doesn't do anything in music at all but he gets paid for his opinion his taste and his ability to get insights that he can maybe drop on certain things which i think is absolutely cool so i personally saw it and i didn't really mind it me personally but i know some people kind of run it the wrong way but i thought it was quite a cool little clip and quite a cool admission because at the end of it there are many people out there and i know quite a few who get paid for doing very very little in my opinion like they're not very good at what they do in the slightest they do the bare minimum but they make it seem legitimately as if they're running an entire empire when essentially they're just getting paid to say this is cool this is good this is not good but for some reason it gives them this weird overinflated sense of self whereas i want to be the person that's behind making a jacket that's behind creating this activation or this launch or this communication style that maybe is going to inspire a whole different range of things as opposed to just being somebody that kind of has a good idea and taste of which is obviously important but people really ham it up and make it more than what it actually is which is something that i've always kind of laughed at internally moving on quickly when i mention this because people have been tagging me and telling me hey you should mention and talk about this this is regarding the fall 2023 louis vuitton show that was headed by the guy from kid super i forgot his name let me scroll down here what's his name again calm delane calm delane was announced as the new temporary uh co-ed director of louis vuitton men's which is really bizarre because louis vuitton men spent a whole you know 
year it felt like or maybe a few months pretending that they were going through some exhaustive process of trying to find the next person there was all this criteria around it they put out these false promises and false hope there'll be somebody black and there's so many cool interesting black designers who are really pushing things forward like the grace wells bonners and the martin rose and a few others out there and just other people in general who would maybe create and kind of extend and tell that kind of louis vuitton story and kind of take the baton over from virgil r.i.p and sort of be able to tell a completely different interesting story that can maybe we continue that journey and inspire many different people and kids going up and in the end of it they just resorted to hiring kid super who in my opinion is no better than what the people at mad happy are doing i know some of you guys out there think this this was cool and this was good but i thought it was trash and if anything this was kind of this calm guy um what it, this calm delaying guy from kid super essentially doing his best impression of virgil abloh that's what it felt like it felt like he was cosplaying it felt like he was larping live action role playing as virgil abloh and for me if i'm if you're somebody sat there who didn't really like virgil's designs but then you can sit here and say you like this part of me wants to say you're racist <laughs> like part of me does because essentially this is him doing virgil's work without all the extras without all the actual edit kind of kitschy um ex you know um recruitments and whatnot and little you know ex eccentricities and whatnot he added and splashed and salt babies way all over it this is essentially what it is this is like a stripped down pared down muted um you know copy of what virgil did essentially this is what i would imagine that brand number 21 because i feel like number 21 has no identity whoever designs it do your job fantastic well done but whenever i see their runway pictures of that brand number 21 it always feels like they just copy whoever's in trend so back when phoebe filer was around at celine number 21 just looked like a really crappy copy of what phoebe filer celine looked like and now we have whatever's going on now you know from otolenga and all these other people doing cool interesting things if you're like number 21 just kind of like swings and in roundabouts in terms of the trends it kind of tries to copy and i feel like this is basically the same thing where it's essentially taking all of virgil's kind of you know um style codes and ways of doing things and his silhouettes and prints and all this sort of stuff and kind of doing it in a stripped back paired back muted fashion and for me I didn't like it in a slice. I personally thought it was completely underwhelming. And if anything goes to speak to why the appointment of the Kid Super guy was maybe one of the biggest disappointments ever when it comes to following somebody great who kind of unfortunately was taken from us too soon. More so because of all the nonsense that they said beforehand. If they would have just hired this guy anyway, it would have made it would have still hurt, but fair. But they made such a big deal out of making it seem like they were being conscious of his family and his legacy and his passing. They didn't want to hire anyone too soon because it was in bad taste. When really, you know, these companies don't have taste, principles, morals, or any kind of ethics or empathy in the slightest anyway, right? They're called hard business, which makes complete sense. They have to, you know, look at the flipping uh, cheat sheet all the time. Fair enough but they made it seem as if it was coming from a place of empathy a place of care a place of passion a place of compassion a place of wanting to do right and kind of extend this legacy and talk about interesting things and go forward and have an interest message and inspire different kids growing up blah 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 and tell it to be a black story a street story whatever it may be called and in the end he just hired this guy that's essentially doing his own diet version of fucking virtual Abloh's work and me personally i didn't like in the slightest it was boring it was crap in my opinion it didn't really do anything for me it didn't have any of that wow factor that we know virgil's work to have and it just felt really kind of you know whatever and if anything this show didn't need to have a co-ed designer if you told me this show was created entirely by the team that virgil left behind that louis vuitton who did a few of the shows post his death because a few of the shows wasn't fleshed out as much because he didn't leave you know he left a lot of stuff behind but he didn't leave you know six seven years worth of stuff but enough stuff to kind of flesh out some ideas and they kind of plug the gaps if you told me this was just done by the team there that works behind the scenes i would have believed it but if this is you hiring somebody give them a big salary allow them to work outside out of the atelier that flipping virgil's working in in paris and whatnot and try and make it seem as if he's a new designer of louis vuitton men's then i say this is very 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 underwhelming in my opinion especially for the people out there who say virgil's designs weren't good and they were too gaudy and he did too much and he was just maybe a better brand communicator and collaborator than he was an actual designer cool so those kind of things but if you like this if you like this you might not like black people because this is essentially just virgil stripped down virgil without all the extraness that which i think made him special 
or looking back on some of the stuff all the things that were a bit excessive and over the top actually made the designs what they were because there was like nothing you'd ever seen on the flipping runway because it came from somebody who wasn't classically trained it came from somebody who was always a bit of an outsider it came from somebody whose taste levels were a little bit off kilter three percent yeah going back to his kind of you know um uh, the design ethos and whatnot that was what something you kind of relate to but i'm looking at all these looks as i'm scrolling down and i'm seeing nothing but pared down stripped down diet copycat virgil abloh louis vuitton men's it's not interesting in the slightest for me maybe somebody else can look at it and think it's different but for me it doesn't tell an interesting story it doesn't tell his story well either the kid super guy i don't really know what his point of view is what his taste levels are what his inspirations are it kind of just feels like you know like i said a copy version of what virgil was doing all of these things i could imagine virgil designing but doing them in a far more interesting um way than what this calm delane guy is doing and for me it just doesn't feel interesting in the slightest none of it zero from the bags to the jackets to the coats to the shapes to the silhouettes it's all so derivative and again this is somebody like a virgil who hasn't been interested for long when did he get a job at louis vuitton men's was it 2019 or something it wasn't that long he was at louis vuitton men's so it's not even like he went in there and he had like a real um you know like he's not it's like he's not like he had like alessandro michelli type of defined communication style or code for his clothing it was just a short period of time and for him to do exactly the same thing and not even try and reinterpret it or make it fresh speaks a lot for what he's doing but this is a review courtesy of vogue it says rogue rosalia jumped on the roof of a vintage yellow car and performed in a super puffer and the triple xl track pants and calm delane came out on stage in a green bucket hat with the whole menswear team this probably speaks to the stylistic and musical differences between what calm's doing already and what virgil did right rosalia on a yellow car it's like you know the whitest guy getting one of the biggest girls in reggaeton or trap reggaeton whatever it's called to perform at a louis vuitton, louis vuitton show not for me in between there'd be louis vuitton menswear collective composite of an event collage with comms ideas the stars contributed to ibrahim kara uh contribution the styling so look at look at all the chefs in the kitchen it's such a bizarre way to approach business i would have thought lvmh would be a little bit more cute a little bit more you know business-like and strategic how are you going to have the louis vuitton menswear team collective combs ideas kid super and the contributions of ibrahim kamara so ibrahim kamara is still styling it Colm is now designing it in collaboration with the collective at louis vuitton men's huh too many chefs in the kitchen for me too many chefs because the reason why I say too much is because Ibrahim, from what I remember, people speaking about Ibrahim Kamara, when he was working with Virgil, he was a little bit more involved than just styling. It wasn't just him seeing the clothes and just making them look good on the runway. He was involved in maybe ideating something, stripping this back, pinning this back, adding a belt there, adding that there, adding that there. So it was a little bit more, you know, his fingers were a little bit more in different places. And, if, you know, when you think about the identity of Louis Vuitton post Virgil, he kind of carried that torch pretty well. So to him to kind of now just be doing styling and having those two only do design doesn't really make sense to me. It continues. Um, attention grabbing communication combined with cult item creations is a giant luxury brand game these days. That's not that these cases of Louis Vuitton menswear department, of course, although this brand centered um, a phase of taking a special care over who to be done, created uh, uh, Delane, uh, bringing in Delane with his can do, cheerful, collaborative personality and his Brooklyn self store, anything can be done, puzzle in one measure of the company's will to keep the flame of Virgil Abloh legacy burning. This also, and also this like can do Brooklyn thing. The stories people in, in flipping fashion want to tell are so cringe. This just sounds like he kind of copied his kind of origin story from Aaron Bondaroff. This sounds like the origins of the rec center. If you know, you know. A New York thing back in the day when Aaron Bondaroff went to, he made that rec center place actually, um, where he basically had people do loads of cool, interesting things under this one creative kind of warehouse space, sort of similar to what um you know um, andy warhol was doing back in the day and the idea behind it was to house all these different brands to have poetry readings and club nights and little gigs and whatnot dj live streams panel discussions podcasts we're all going to be housing this one warehouse place and obviously the brand as well that they were kind of you know funneling and pushing out of there it kind of felt like he just copied that entire thing and again i haven't heard of any of this sort of stuff and i'm super plugged in on the internet and you know exist in this sort of weird kind of scene and the first time I heard of the brand Kid Super, legit, legit, I'm not lying, was when the guy started going out of Yes Jewels. 
when they had their brief romance that's the first time i ever heard who the brand was and who he was about and whatnot i'd never heard of it in the slightest so this whole weird infatuation behind his origin story and what he did back in the day is a bit lame because no one cares because out there in the streets no one's wearing that shit it continues another possibility is that the naive name and hand-drawn artwork of delane's own brand kid super had uh, had a bearing on it his multicolored childlike paintings of people and domestic interiors were hyper elaborated into Vuitton patchworks tracksuits and jacket onto suit and formal coat and a souvenir LV Capal. The link there is that Bablo's works always spoke about the importance of remembering and cherishing the child within the adult, a symbol of him and hope, and that turned out to be a trope that was conjured up again on set. Okay, cool. That's a hope. That's a trope of the show. That's the inspiration where it's coming from. But it's too Virgil like. Like have your own ideas. Come with something a bit more interesting please and rosalia sung models could be seen behind her rummaging through a louis vuitton trunk to find packed away childlike toys program notes and details the idea of a millennial rites of passage again i like rosalia she's got some cool songs but what the hell does rosalia have to do with the clothes of up above i just showed i just quickly scan through some of those clothes again if you're just listening to this please check louis vuitton for men's 2023 and you'll see there's not real much connection between how rosalia sings and the clothes that were available on that runway there's nothing at all, in my opinion, that's complete, that's similar to them at all. Zero, me personally. But what do I know? When the models emerged onto the runway at the perimeter of the set, they were wearing mashups of classical suits with twisted medals. So t- twisted medals, and it began the trend of the season. Several long, slim tailor coats. The lens import included faces patchworked on leather in neutral browns with LV monogram, casual wear buckets, and a bucket hat. So basically, it was designed predominantly by the. Louis Vuitton menswear team it sounds like and he just did a few pieces here and there maybe that j- jacket with a face that he took a picture of himself wearing in the mirror I guess he was proud of that but everything else has been designed by, by the men so what's the point of that whole big press release that he was designing anything if he actually didn't design majority of it he just probably sprinkled a few looks here and there such a bizarre move the collective nature of the show, some of this, some of that, and the individual items in the chat about made it hard to read as a coherent narrative. Okay, I'm glad I'm not the only one. Above and beyond that, the mesh, the, the Maison super ability to in- innovate widely illustrious. I can't read. Above uh, and beyond that, the mansions. Sorry, above and beyond that, the Maison super ability to innovate wildly luxurious techniques was in no doubt. What does that even mean? That's not something you get paid to say, isn't it? Um, what might happen next with Louis Vuitton remains to be seen. The lens graffiti in yellow and the grey top coat seem to say, blurry vision of a bright future, it read. Yeah, whatever. I think it sucks personally for me. That's my opinion. Um, if you like this and you don't like Virgil, you're probably racist because this is just pair down, strip down, basic diet version of what Virgil was doing. Um, and if anything, it doesn't tell a compelling enough story to look over the talents of grace world bonner and martin rose if you pick this guy ahead of those two stellar creatives in this field because you felt like he would do a better job and this is what you're presenting then i feel like you're lying personally unless they just had two car crash level interviews the ones where you turn up late you're not prepared you're stuttering all over the place you're terrible at speaking you don't ingratiate yourself well to people's friends maybe it happened that could have probably happened there are two interviews didn't go too well but from pure talent level, from pure evidence of what we have and what they produced prior, if this is what you're comparing it to what Martin Rose does, even what she's just done from helping out for stuff to do with Demna, forget what she's done with her own brand and what Grace Wells has just done with the last couple of seasons, just even with Adidas now, that's kind of gone skyrocket. If you're comparing this to, it's not in the same atmosphere or same universe for me. This is absolutely terrible, um, his version of it for me. I think it's absolutely garbage, it's crap same version of what Virgil was doing but stripped down and pared down it doesn't tell you just complaining story in the slightest and if anything it kind of you know it kind of really just calls into question who is making the decisions at the top level over that Louis Vuitton in my opinion because that was a horrible decision of somebody to take over from Virgil who I felt like was more important than the clothes you know it wasn't just the clothes on the flipping runway it was everything that came around it the culture the branding um the marketing uh the communication the love uh, the community, all that stuff involved in it, the music, of course, the personal relationship, the story, the narrative. This is just like terrible for me, personally, terrible for me, terrible. And if anything, it looks like as well that like he copied his set from like a Tyler Creator show or something. It just doesn't feel creative in the slightest, in my opinion. It's just a bit derivative, a little bit lazy, and a bit of a waste of time. But hey, what do I know? What do I know? Next on the list, we quickly want to talk about this. Where is it? Let's talk about it because I feel like this is really interesting. So, 
Courtesy of RA, there's this news. London Field Day reveals Aphex Twin and others for 2023. Absolutely crazy Aphex Twin playing, right? London Festival Field Day announced the first 21 acts uh, playing in 2023, 21, 21, 21. Return to Victoria Park on Saturday, August the 19th. Field Day has confirmed Aphex Twin as a headliner after teasing his return last week. Joining here would be Bonobo, Jayla G, Arka, um, Kilila, Fe Fever Ray, Actress, LSDX, LSD XOXO, Juliana Huxtable, um, Sudane Archives, Tisha, Modrat, Subtract, Julia Tess, Mount Kimball, and Sir, what was that? Suru Singhi, I think his name is, or whatever that person's name is. So, great lineup, right? The issue I have with this, especially with Aphex Twin playing, headlining a show like this, is absolutely amazing, is that Field Day is legitimately, maybe I think, one of the worst festivals we have here in London. And the reason maybe isn't their fault because field day is usually in this park called victoria park which is in hackney which is a very trendy cool fun nice park to go to to cycle to run to watch the ducks and little pond and whatnot great amazing but unfortunately this park is basically in the middle of an entire um neighborhood like housing area like there's clouds is basically that circle the entirety of the park it's kind of in the middle um, it kind of reminds me a little bit of Central Park, like a little mini badge of Central Park, all these flats around it. But of course, the flats are so near to the park that they can hear everything happening in there. So when festivals happen, they obviously have to put a limiter on the volume. And the sound is so bad at these festivals because the noise pollution that neighbors complain about, which is, I think, they're right to complain about because it's just a public park, having a flipping full on you know, um, Coachella type parts festival there would probably be annoying as hell, especially if everyone pissing all over your flipping front door. But the noise is so muted, it's so limited that it makes it impossible to have a good time unless you go right to the front. And for me personally, when it comes to going to a festival, the whole point why festivals are amazing is number one, they're very cost effective in terms of you being able to see so many different amazing people for so you know, for less than what you'd pay maybe to see one person. So think of a price to see, you know, to see an Aphex, tw Aphex Twin and an Arca flipping um, show, right? Separately. You're probably looking at about 50 to to £100 anyway per ticket. So if you can go to a festival and pay $100 or £100 to see two people that you like, plus six others that you don't know, it becomes good value for money. And also, it's it being a festival and it being in an outside place, in a, you know, in a field, in a park, wherever it may be, in an open place, you can kind of pick little spots anywhere you want and kind of jam and chill. You can sit around a bag, you can sit on some benches, you can find a hill somewhere. You can just enjoy yourself and not be, you know, confined to the usual thing that everyone does when they go to gigs, where you try and get as close as you can to the front or maybe just decide so you can hear and see everything. But if you have to do that, it kind of defeats the whole purpose of the, of the festival. But it's a completely different, you know, experience being at the front that is being at the back. But I remember seeing videos of people that went there, were going there myself and hearing how bad the sound was just standing kind of near where the bars are. And I feel like the bar should be like a good kind of gauge on how good your sound is. Because at the bar, you should be like kind of feeling what's going on, tapping your feet, nodding your head and willing to kind of well, while you wait for your drink or wait to get served. But sometimes when you go to field day, you go to the bar and you legitimately can't hear the words of the song. You can maybe hear the melodies and the bass, but you can't hear the words. You can't hear what the person's saying. And the stage is only over there. It's absolutely crazy. So legitimately, the sound is terrible. And again, most of it has to do with local council issues. Maybe field day themselves don't want to put the sound up high. But I feel like Aphex Twin and Arca and all these people are kind of wasted on field day because the sound is so terrible with it being in Victoria Park. Now, maybe something has changed. Maybe there's been a whole long, um, you know, consolation, consolation, uh, consolation, whatever that word is, um, session be happening behind the scenes with labors and stuff where they've come to the agreement that they're going to, um, you know, allow them to crank the noise up for that one day and it'd be okay, not be an issue. Maybe that's the case. But from recent experience of going to a field day in the past, it is so underwhelming. And I feel like these bookings are kind of wasted on them. So as much as I'd want to go and see FX Twin and Arca perform live and maybe see someone like a Junior Hoxable again, a Subtract again, uh, LSD XO, XO again. Oh, as I'm just realizing on a picture, um, LSD XO, XO and Junior Hoxable actually playing back to back. So that should be absolutely cool. 
and maybe I can make right with Julian Huxtable after the last time that I bumped into a panorama by him. And, you know, I didn't have the best interaction with her. And she probably thought I was some creep. I don't know why, but hey. Um, but I would like to see them perform. But I feel like this lineup, in my opinion, is wasted on Victoria Park, personally. I feel like it's genuinely wasted on them because the sound is so terrible. I'm hoping it's not and it's different, but I feel like this lineup might be wasted on them going forward. But let's see, innit? Let's see. Obviously, tickets will be available. They're available now already. I'm not too, too sure. Probably you'll be able to buy them. Let's see if we can get them ready. This is courtesy of RA. See if you can buy the tickets here. Ready? Can you buy them? No, you cannot. It's not available yet. Tickets are going to be available from Friday, January 27th and from 11 a.m. So, obviously, if you're interested, make sure you click and you buy them. But I don't know, man. Victoria Park for me to see a festival, day festival in London. Waste of time. Not a good idea. Sounds going to be terrible. And you're going to leave it thinking, why the hell did I waste my money on that? Why the hell waste my money on that? Anyway, that's been Excellent Things Show episode number 423, I think. Um, if you had a good time and you enjoyed yourself, then please make sure you smash the like button for me if you're watching via YouTube. If you're listening to the sh- show via the audio format on the podcast app, of course, you know what to do. Leave me a good five-star review on your platform. Maybe listen to it on iTunes, listening to it on flipping um, Spotify or another place where you can rate. Please do share it with people um, and all that good stuff. And yeah, man, thank you for joining in to episode number 643 it's been a pleasure to have your company i enjoyed every single minute of it sorry for taking so long to update you on what's been going on in my life and whatnot and i'll be back again very soon take care be safe everybody peace out and have fun